For more debates, updates and bonus content, sign up at thebigconversation.show. I mean, I'm fascinated to know from you, Rowan, to what part the rational aspect plays then, because you've obviously done those debates with Richard Dawkins and Philip Pullman, you know, the new atheist pushing rationally back against Christianity and you having to present a sort of rational case for. But but ultimately, you know, is there only so far you can go in, in sort of, is there got to be another component that, that goes alongside that, presumably? I think one of the things that I always want to put into those discussions is is to raise the question of what we actually mean by rational at the end of the day because it's a word that's been captured by a certain segment of the intellectual population, as if rationality always meant a kind of near mathematical kind of reasoning, where conclusions were tight, arguments were neat and you know, operating in straight lines. And one of the, the great things about um, one strand of Christian thinking is that it would say, Yes, we claim to be rational, but reason is a much bigger thing than simply mathematical conclusions. We reason our way in and out of all sorts of positions. We, we accumulate relevant experience without quite knowing how we're doing it. You might even say we reason our way into learning to ride a bicycle. Not because we, you know, we are taking the instructions off the internet, which I suspect is a very bad way of learning to ride a bicycle, but because somehow our, our embodied imagination and thinking learns a way of being in the world. And that's reasoning in the fullest sense. And I think, again, the Eastern Christian tradition, when it talks about nous, N-O-U-S, the, the intellect as it's often translated, is, is about something much more than what we usually think of as intellectual activity. It's, it's the deep core of all this learning, responding, adjusting to, acclimatizing to a reality which is giving us a huge range of mysteriously diverse signals. And there's a tiny sliver of that, which is the signals that our logical mind picks up. But to be reasonable, I think, is to be in tune to be picking up the signals we need to pick up and responding with our whole being to them. So one of the things I'd want to say certainly to Richard Dawkins is don't imagine that thinking is just one thing. Thinking is a richer, deeper, stranger thing than you imagine. Yes, that's a really, um, one of my favorite translations of noose is, is the heart Absolutely. mind. Absolutely. There's a lot of, lot of theologians talk about that. And I, again, it was one of those things that really brought me up short when I first read that, yes. you know, the orthodox notion that your, your mind is in your heart, right? Literally, obviously, you have your, your intellect up here, which does that thinking, and that's fine and important. But your, as, as Rowan is saying, your experiential thinking mind is, is in your heart, it's connected to your heart. And once you, uh, it's, it's interesting, once you start to think about that, you realize how much Western culture has separated the notion of, of heart and the notion of mind. And we've created, as, as Rowan says, we've created this notion of a kind of etiolated reason, which somehow can take the rational individual to truth, um, which isn't isn't real. Um, and it's a, it's a very disconnected, inhuman, weird way of thinking about things. And it's not, as, as Rowan also says, it's not the way actually most of us experience human life at mm. all. We don't work like that. Mm. Mm. Um, so it's uh, it's but it's a myth that keeps clinging on it, it's a, it's a very persistent one isn't it I, i'm thinking back to that lovely book by mary midgley called the myths we live by published a mm. decade or more ago um which which is a wonderful diagnosis of the the curious stories that western civilization has invented to make itself feel better and mary mm. midgley was very good at pointing us back to the fact that the narrative we've lost is the narrative of being part of something. And if you're part of something, then you know, when you're singing in a choir or swimming in the sea, you, you have to feel your way into something that is acting upon you and much greater than you. And that is thinking at the deepest level and thinking of the heart. I think also it's the theme that um, Ian McGilchrist has been elaborating in his, in his books, especially in this formidable new 1500 page book called Dump the Matter with Things, which I'm trying to read at the moment. But that's mm. a great sort of witness to the, the way in which we are involved in our thinking and our perceiving in ways that um, and narrow scientism doesn't 
begin to get hold of, yeah. and yet there's nothing anti-scientific about saying so. Mm. You, you and I are both trying to grapple with that book, Rowan, uh, by Ian McGilchrist. I've, uh, our next edition of the big conversation is is a live conversation with Ian McGilchrist and uh, Sharon Dirks, who's a, a Christian neuroscientist. So, so this is all, uh, yeah, tying together very well. Mm.